squeezing ISIL's heart its core in Syria and Iraq will make it harder. For them to pump their terror and propaganda to the rest of the world. At the same time, as we know from San Bernardino. Where I'll visit with families later today. We have to remain vigilant here at home. Our counter-terrorism, intelligence, homeland security. and law enforcement communities are working 24-7 to protect our homeland. And all of us can do our part by staying vigilant, by saying something if we see something that is suspicious. by refusing to be terrorized, and by staying united as one American family. In short, for all the very real progress America has made over the past seven years. We still have some unfinished business. And I plan on doing everything I can with every minute of every day that I have left as president to deliver on behalf of the American people. Since taking this office, I've never been more optimistic about a year ahead than I am right now. And in 2016, I'm going to leave it out all on the field. So with that, let me take some questions. I'll start with Roberta Rampton of Reuters. Question, MR. President, you're going to California today. And as you said earlier this week. You told the nation that there's no specific or credible threat of a similar attack. But how is it really possible to know? I mean, aren't similar plots going to be just as hard to detect beforehand?
and some lawmakers are saying that your government should review the social media of all people. Applying for visas to come to this country. What do you think of that idea? Should that be mandatory? President Obama, well, Roberta, you're absolutely right that it is very difficult for us to detect lone wolf plots or plots involving a husband and wife. In this case because despite the incredible vigilance and professionalism of all our law enforcement, Homeland Security. etc. It's not that different from us trying to detect the next mass shooter. You don't always see it. They're not always communicating publicly. And if you're not catching what they say publicly, then it becomes a challenge. We are continuing to work at every level to make sure that There's no slip between information sharing among agencies. We're continuing to strengthen our information sharing with foreign countries. And because, in part, of the tragedy in Paris. I think you are seeing much greater cooperation from our European partners on these issues. But this is a different kind of challenge than the sort that we had with an organization like Al-Qaeda that involved highly trained operatives who are working as cells or as a network. Here, essentially, you have ISIL trying to encourage or induce somebody who may be prey to this kind of propaganda. And it becomes more difficult to see. It does mean that they're less likely to be able to carry out large, complex attacks. But as we saw in San Bernardino, obviously, you can still do enormous damage.
The issue of reviewing social media for those who are obtaining visas I think may have gotten garbled a little bit. Because there may be it's important to distinguish between posts that are public. Social media on a Facebook page versus private communications through various social media or apps. And our law enforcement and intelligence professionals are constantly monitoring public posts. And that is part of the visa review process. That people are investigating what individuals have said publicly and questioned about any statements that they may be made. But if you have a private communication between two individuals, that's harder to discern, by definition. And one of the things we'll be doing is engaging with the high-tech community to find out how we can. In an appropriate way, do a better job if we have a lead to be able to. Track a suspected terrorist. But we're going to have to recognize that no government is. Going to have the capacity to read every single person's text or emails or social media. If it's not posted publicly, then there are going to be feasibility issues that are probably insurmountable at some level, and it raises questions about our values. I mean, keep in mind it was only a couple of years ago where we were having a major debate about whether the government was becoming too much like Big Brother. And overall, I think we've struck the right balance in protecting civil liberties and making sure that U.S. citizens' privacy is preserved. That we are making sure that there's oversight to what our intelligence agencies do. But we're going to have to continue to balance our needs. For security with people's legitimate concerns about privacy.
and because the internet is global and communication systems are global. The values that we apply here oftentimes are ones that folks who are trying to come into. The country are also benefiting from because they're using the same technologies. But this is precisely why we're working very hard to bring law enforcement. intelligence, and high-tech companies together. Because we're going to have to really review what we can do both technically as well as consistent with our laws and our values in order to try to discern more rapidly some of the potential threats that may be out there. David Jackson Question, thank you, MR. President. A Gitmo question. Congress has made it pretty clear that they're just not going to let you transfer prisoners to the United States for trial. But some people think you already have the executive authority. To transfer those prisoners and close Gitmo itself next year. My question is, do you believe you have that authority and are you willing to exercise it to close that place? President Obama, well, first of all. We've been working systematically another example of persistence in reducing the population. We have a review process. Those who are eligible for transfer we Locate in countries that have accepted some of these detainees. They monitor them, and it's been determined that they can be transferred. And my expectation is by early next year, we should have reduced that population. Below 100. 
and we will continue to steadily chip away at the numbers in Guantanamo. There's going to come to a point where we have an irreducible population people who pose a significant threat. But for various reasons, it's difficult for us to try them in an Article 3 court. Some of those folks are going through a military commission process. But there's going to be a challenge there. Now, at that stage, I'm presenting a plan to Congress about how we can close Guantanamo. I'm not going to automatically assume that Congress says no. I'm not being coy, David. I think it's fair to say that there's going to be significant resistance from some quarters to that. But I think we can make a very strong argument that it doesn't make sense for us to be spending an extra $100 million. $200 million, $300 million, $500 million, a billion dollars, to have a secure setting for 50. 60, 70 people. And we will wait until Congress has definitively said no to a well thought out plan with numbers attached to it before we say anything definitive about my executive authority here. I think it's far preferable if I can get stuff done with Congress. Question, so actually you could write on your own? President Obama, David, as I said and I think you've seen me on a whole. bunch of issues like immigration I'm not going to be forward leaning on. What I can do without Congress before I've tested what I can do with Congress. And every once in a while, they'll surprise you. And this may be one of those places because I think we can make a really strong argument.
Guantanamo continues to be one of the key magnets for jihadi recruitment. To Roberta's question earlier about how do they propagandize and convince somebody here in the United States. Who may not have a criminal record or a history of terrorist activity to start shooting this is part of what they feed. This notion of a gross injustice, that America is not living up to its professed ideals. We know that. We see the internet traffic. We see how Guantanamo has. been used to create this mythology that America is at war with Islam. And for us to close it is part of our counter-terrorism strategy that is supported by our military. our diplomatic, and our intelligence teams. So when you combine that with the fact that it's really expensive that we are essentially at, This point detaining a handful of people and each person is costing several million dollars to detain. When there are more efficient ways of doing it, I think we can make a strong argument. But I'll take your point that it will be an uphill battle. Now, every battle I've had with Congress over the last five years has been uphill. But we keep on surprising you by actually getting some stuff done. Sometimes that may prove necessary, but we try not to get out ahead of ourselves on that. Julie Pace Question, thank you, MR President I wanted to ask you about some of the broader challenges in the Middle East Some of the Republicans who are running for president have argued that the Mideast and the United States would be safer if we hadn't had regime change in places like Iraq, Libya, and Egypt.
and having gone through the experience of the Arab Spring and the aftermath. I wonder what you now see the US role in the Middle East in terms of trying to push dictators out of power. Would you advise future presidents to call for authoritarian leaders to step down as you did? And just specifically on Syria, at this point. Is it your expectation that Bashar Assad's presidency will outlast yours? <laughs>